and welcome to Julie and Friends, a Life of Love podcast. Today, I'm very excited to bring you this wonderful woman. She lives in San Diego. She's a grandmother, a widow, an author, best-selling author, and a student, spiritual student turned teacher. And um, she's going to share with us some insight from her travels and um, give us some of her magic of what her daily life is like and what she wants to to project into the world. So we're really happy to have you. Her name is Kathleen Donnelly Israel. Thanks for being on today. Good morning or whatever time it is. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. We're so happy to have you and hear your message. Um, So I wanted to talk about your book. Would you like to share with my audience what your book is and um, we'll uh, let people know they can get on Amazon, but I don't want to, I don't want to miss that opportunity to let people know um, your book. And then we'll talk about how you got inspired to write it and your adventures. Okay. Um, My book is wisdom on the Camino, a spiritual journey, sharing forgiveness and possibilities to inspire the rest of your life. By Kathleen Donnelly Israel, me, <laughs> and um, I. You know when I took care of my husband for seventeen years while he had Parkinson's disease, and I had to be there. Um, he was completely disabled um, for the last seven years of his life, and so I had to stay home and be with him. And so I started studying on the internet, enlightened thought leaders, and um, did a lot of personal healing for myself. And after all those years, I developed some philosophies, just um, thinking about all the things that I learned from them, and just making sense of them for myself. And I wanted to write a book about those philosophies. And I was reluctant to be teachy. And so I walk the Camino Santiago de Compostelo and realized that I had told people on the Camino all my philosophies. So I wrote my book about walking the Camino and telling people about the philosophies that I had developed. So it it was such a joy to write. I was, oh my gosh, just to remember all the memories of the Camino. And so that's, that's how I did it. And I I had told, I didn't take, make a journal. I just wrote on Facebook and told my friends what I had been doing. And also my kids set up a WhatsApp for me called Moms Walkabout Check-In. And so I told them all the gory details I didn't, that I didn't tell my friends. And so between those two records of my trip, I wrote my book. Oh wow! So you had a a virtual memoir with uh, with your your um, electronics and your communication with your kids, and then your face, your WhatsApp. Oh wow! I love that. And to me, it's like being on that five hundred mile walk, that journey through the elements. Um, you you gained that confidence and the clarity to be able to write it down to realize that you had a message that mattered that would change people's lives or give them insight that might help them. And, and you had been through 17 years and I can't imagine that last seven, um, you know, how much, how much you went through watching, you know, your husband decline. And, you know, it was um, to me when I've seen people go through to Parkinson's or any kind of progressive illness, it's like, it's not just one funeral. It's like you lose a little of them at a time. So, that's the hardest thing is saying goodbye to all those things that you once had and, and figuring out what you still love and what you can cherish each day. So you you had such resilience that I'm not surprised you were able to walk 500 miles and then you did it twice. That's the thing that, that that's the thing about it is that I thought Ron and I would be riding our bicycles across France in our old age. You know, I thought I thought we would be doing fun things. And um, when I found out he had Parkinson's disease and those things mm-hmm. just evaporated. And so I had to develop new dreams. And so my girlfriend 
uh, Judy went on the Camino and I saw, you know, she shared on Facebook and I saw that and I thought, you know what? I want to do that. When Ron's done with his disease, I'm going to do that. And so that, you know, that became my new dream of my future, what I would do. So at that point, um, when you heard about it from your friend, Judy, did you realize a lot of people, I saw like a third of people do it for a spiritual reason. Did you realize it was a spiritual experience for many people? Um, or you just were interested in, in seeing the countryside and exploring uh, by foot? And Well, you know, I, um, I am Catholic and it's a Catholic pilgrimage. And so that worked you know, and I am a spiritual person. I, I love my faith. And um, I actually apologize for it in my book, because, you know, not everybody thinks that the Catholic Church is a good thing. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I, I do love my faith. And uh, so anyway, it was it was wonderful for me, actually. Absolutely, absolutely. Wonderful. Wow. So that's great. So, um, I just, I just really admire it. Did, what time of year did you do it? Was it? Um... Oh my gosh, I did it in the spring. So I, I flew, to, I flew to Paris and I stayed there for a week so that I wouldn't have jet lag, and so I enjoyed Paris uh, for a week, and then I flew to Baritz, uh, which is close to where the Camino starts, and. And I stayed there overnight, and then I took the train to Saint Jean Pied de Port, and started in, you know, spent the night there and started out. So I was so ready to go by the time I got there. So I was like, I can't wait to get get going on this thing. And um, you know, it was um, it was a wonderful experience. People, I I did research, and they said to stay at the Bellari in San Jean. And so that's where I stayed and they were right. It was a wonderful experience. The guy who uh, ran the place, um, he, on the first night when we were, when we were having dinner together, he told us to name our, um, name our Camino experience, give it a name. And so I called mine uh, deeper than I know, because I had, I mean, I'm Catholic, but I'm I'm kind of spiritual too. So I, after Ron died, I went to the spiritualist church, and they actually talked to the dead, and um, so um, I got a reading, and the lady told me that I was um, I was going to go on a journey, and that I was going to it was a spiritual journey. And it was so deep that it was all the way into my blood, this journey. And so I thought, well, she didn't even know I was planning on going on the Camino. <laughs> and so it meant so much to me when she said that. So I, I think my, my whole body, all the way to my blood, <laughs> wanted to go on the Camino. And so that's what I said, deeper than I know, the name of my Camino. Um, my communal experience deeper than you know and did that become a mantra as you as you walked I, I know you had lots of time to to think and you know 500 miles did was that a recurring thought or did you just sort of place that intention and then come back to it yeah I just um I I placed my intention but you know what what you say really if you say something it makes it real and um, I think that's what it did. It just made it real, you know, for the whole trip. But I, there is a mantra that they have over there. I can't remember what it is. Uh, something like um, all the all for God or something like that. Um, I can't remember what the mantra is. But there, <laughs> I remember when I was there, somebody said, "Okay, here's the mantra," and it's something about you know all for God. So, oh, wow. Well, I can imagine there's 
there's you get to have a commonality with the other people. Did you when you were walking, did you pair up with people or did you do it completely solo or were there legs where you developed relationships with others or? Yes, it was so exciting. It was um, my gosh, <laughs> but I walk slow. I'm an old lady. You know, I was 69 years old when I started and I was 70 by the time I finished. So, um, yeah, I um, I walk slow. And so it's hard to find somebody that will walk slow with you. And I did. I found people who would walk slow with me just for a little while, not for a long time. There was a woman that I, I walked with for a couple of days, maybe three or four days. And it's so funny when... Uh, when you separate after a relationship like that, I think on both sides, you're like, yeah, I need to do my own Camino. I need to, <laughs> I need to get out of this situation with this person. And so you just kind of drift apart. Um, but um, yeah, people taught me things. I taught people things. One of the problems was going to the bathroom. I mean, here in America, oh. it's against the law to expose yourself. But over there, people go in the bushes all the time. And so here I was, an American, with this sensibility. And um, you just have to use the bushes. And so the, one of the ladies showed me how to do it. So I had no idea what you do. <laughs> and she me, so thank you, Connie. <laughs> <laughs> Connie's your, you know, we always tease women. We have bathroom buddies, but Connie was a real bathroom buddy. <laughs> she, she was. was. <laughs> she was. But yeah, they. Um, and I talk about it in my book. So um, there you go. I don't know if you want me to talk about it here, but <laughs> anyway. No, I was going to ask you what was the biggest surprise for you that you had didn't expect, and you know, we do we t do take for granted where we're gonna you know, take care of that. So that that's a, something real that someone would need to know. So I know. And when I when I got to like, okay, so I had to find a place in the bushes, and I would go find a place in the bushes. And there would be toilet paper everywhere. And I was like, horrified that people had trashed the Camino like that. And so at first, I started picking them up. And then I thought, Oh, my God, this is not a good idea. And <laughs> you're going to get sick, right? I, I know. I was like, oh, you know, and and so then uh, after that, every time I saw a whole bunch of toilet paper all over the place, I thought, oh, I found a good place. Oh, great. You know, and <laughs> I never I never left my paper. I always I had a bag with me and I put it in there. So I, I didn't do that. But a lot of people did. <laughs> Well, I think that touches on one of your themes is forgiveness. And if that was just a little example of how you imply, you em, um, embraced forgiveness, even at that, that very basic level, like instead of getting angry with these people, you're like, oh, I found, you know, there's a sign that this is a good spot. This is acceptable. Uh, but you didn't let that take every step like, oh, my gosh, you know, like you could have held on to that irritation that people were littering. But yeah, you know, that, you wanted to create a, a solution. And then you realized when in Rome or on the Santiago, you just, <laughs> this is what is done, you know, and right. would you want to go, um, go into more of the forgiveness and, and what, what you realized on the, on the walk on the pilgrimage? Yeah. So, um, well, one reason why I was really glad that I went alone is because I did not have anybody to forgive. I mean, I didn't have anybody to complain to. Um, I, there were people like couples and you would see, you know, what in, in a couple's relationship, you kind of, you know, push each other's buttons and you get grief and stuff. And, and so I, when I saw that, I thought, yeah, I'm really glad I don't have anybody to complain to. I had to just meet every experience and go, oh gosh. And, you know, in the movie Shrek, when Shrek, um, he has an arrow in his bum and he turns around and, uh, you know, just so says, well, will you look at that? And I think that's a great thing to say about anything that's a arrow in your bum is to just say, wow, will you look at that? <laughs> so there's no um, forgiveness needed here. We just have a weird experience here. 
And But the thing about forgiveness that <clears throat> I have gotten into myself, because um, I had a, kind of a rough childhood. I had a alcoholic father. Um, he, was, he was a wonderful artist and a musician, a visual artist and a musician, but he was an alcoholic, rageaholic, child molester, basically. And so I had a lot to forgive. And I used to... I used to forgive him every day. Somebody told me, if, if you don't forgive, then you don't really understand Christ. And so I was like, well, okay, I, you know, this is like bottom line necessary. And so I would just, every morning I would wake up and I would forgive him. And by the next morning, I hated him again. And then, um, so I, I said, I told people I'm forgiving him like an alcoholic forgives one day at a time you know, and, um, there you go. Yeah. And I think that in, when we're sleeping, we process things. And a lot of times I find that too, I'll wake up and I'm like, wait a minute, I dealt with this yesterday and it, here it is again. And, and that's, that's okay. Cause you got to look at it. Like you said, look at that arrow in your butt and, and forgive and move on. Or, you know, just like you said, just be there to observe it. There's nothing to forgive because it just is. Right. Absolutely. I love that. So when I, when um, I uh, was studying uh, while my husband was ill, I learned Ho'oponopono. Have you ever heard of that? Oh, yes. Yes. I love that. Okay. Please forgive me. I love you. So, Thank you. So yes. it's, um, I started using Ho'oponopono and I released so much stuff. It's amazing. I, um, it, it, where the way it goes is I love you and it's all the I love yous you can think of. I love God. God loves me. God loves the other person. The other person loves God. And if you can say I love them, then you say it. But if you can't, it's all right. Um, and I, so it's I love you. I'm sorry. And it's not, I'm sorry I did anything, but I'm sorry this situation exists. And then it's, please forgive me. And it's not forgive me for doing something. Mm -hmm. It's please forgive me for, for what's going on in me that caused me to attract this. Because I attracted this with my low vibration. And um, thank you for, sh and it's thank you, but it's thank you for showing me this so I could heal. If I didn't have this adversity, I wouldn't see my brokenness, and then I couldn't heal. And then it's, I love you again. I love God. God loves me. All the I love yous. And so I, I did that for myself. And um, at one point, I was feeling shame when I said, I'm sorry. And I thought, no, this is not, it's not about shame. It's, it's not about shame at all. And so... I added in, uh, please forgive me, I forgive me. And then I added in, I forgive it up. And when I said, mm -hmm. I forgive it up, I felt a refrigerator sized pain and sorrow come out of my heart and go up to God. And I, I, it was such a release and it was a wonderful experience. And I just, you know, when you're sleeping at night and and your monkey mind brings up all these things that went wrong in your life. And I just sort of, every time that happened, I would just um, <clears throat> do my expanded Ho'oponopono, which I call it. <laughs> and then I got, so after a long time, I got all this sadness mm -hmm. out of me. And it was such a great thing. And um, that was very instrumental in raising my vibration. Because when you have a low vibration, you just attract in all kinds of crap in your life. And when you have a high vibration, you can attract the good experiences. Yeah, and you can see, you can see the good things, right? If you're in a low place, you didn't even recognize the high vibration because you're not, you know, you have to be in tune. It's like a tuning fork, right? You have to be tuned to the to the high and you you took that beautiful ritual that the hawaiian people do that they have and you used it to elevate your spirituality to another level to you know actually you know take all these things like 
they feel like a fireball in your stomach, right? And it's just like this, you don't even realize how deep it is until it finally releases. And you're just like, you, like you said, you just felt it shoot up. And um, Jesus picked it up, your angels or God or whatever, whoever, whatever entity pulled that out of you, but you were, you were there and you asked for it and you were empowered. Sometimes it doesn't, I can, sometimes I feel that it doesn't all go out. And then I ask my angels to untie it or, you know, pull it out to the depths of my being, you know, because some of my sadness is very, very deep. And so when I, I say I forgive it up, and then if I feel like it doesn't go out, then I ask my angels to get it out somehow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Did When you were on the path, did you have any spiritual experiences that you'd want to share? Yeah. So one, one, um, one thing that I started doing a long time ago when I would go away from my husband is I would look for heart-shaped rocks so I could bring it home to him so he would know I thought of him. And so I... Um, as I was walking the Camino, when I started at San John and I, I was walking the Camino, I, um, I started finding all these heart-shaped rocks. And I just felt like my husband was sending me love as I walked. So they were like gifts to my husband. And I, I mean, it's really uncanny. Like every 10th step, I would find a heart-shaped rock. There were that many. And um, so... It, I was blessed. And also, I, when I see butterflies, I think that he's near me. And so, of course, I saw butterflies on the Camino. And mm. uh, that was really, that was really lovely. I, there's so many adventures that I had, and they're, they just seem so comical to me. Um, I was probably in a really good space while I was walking, right? And I was attracting comedy. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> um, well, he did get yeah, to I go was, across France with because you said you you imagine cycling with him, but right, this is just a different and dream. A lot of bicyclers, a lot of bicyclers go on the Camino. Um, they uh, they of course pass you up, but um, they go right along with you. And um, I spoke to one of the cyclist and he had walked the Camino and he was cycling the Camino that time and he said you know you get to see more when you walk it when you're cycling you don't see as much but I guess you know a lot of people do it like bike clubs they had like the Italian bike club <laughs> on on the <clears throat> Camino and um, yes I got to stay with them one one night um, I, I got in really late to Estrella, Estrella, I don't know if they call it Estrella or Estrella. I think they do say Estrella. Um, and uh, that was the only room left was the one that the Italian bicycle club was in. So, so you bunked up with the, psych the Italian cyclists? <laughs> <laughs> I did. They were very respectful, but it was very, very funny. <laughs> I can just see all their their tight spandex, you know, because I was reading how you have to do laundry when you stop and, you know, you might stop at two or three in the afternoon and you do your laundry and you take a shower. But I could just see their um, their gear hanging up all over the bunk room. <laughs> right. And I brought my I brought my clothesline. So I always slept on a lower bunk and I would hang my clothesline around and hang my clothes on it. So it's kind of like, you know, a room inside my bunk. Because my yeah. Oh, that is brilliant. You made yourself a little fort with your clean clothes. <laughs> oh my goodness. It just sounds like such a fantastic adventure. And so were you I mean, you it was pretty easy to find lodging and you, you found they used to call them Aberno or Abagaze. Abergaze. So you you wouldn't make a reservation. You just let the universe provide what your shelter was going to be that night. Were you ever in a place where you're like, I'm not sure I'm going to find shelter tonight or. 
that was the time that I was in Estrella, Estrella mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I started walking and um, I actually could call ahead and make a reservation. And that was because I, I took so long, you know, I, I walked a long time each day. Um, and so I wouldn't get into like four o'clock. So I had to call ahead and say, can I stay there tonight? And um, because all the people would come, you know, maybe get in at two o'clock. And then by the time I got there, there weren't any bunks left. And so I called them. I said, I need a lower bunk. You know, one guy said, well, that's a lot to ask for. And I said, well, I'm 70 years old. I need a lower bunk. And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I was just trying to think of, you know, trying to get up on that bunk. And anyway, it would, um, I could do it. But it, you know, would be difficult. Um, so that was really great. Uh, that was really the only night that I didn't get a bunk. I actually walked 28k that day because I there was nowhere to stay. I came to the town I thought I was going to go to, and all the places were either closed. There was a place they say, okay, we open in April. But they didn't open in April. They waited till after Easter to um, open. And so I would get there and nobody was there. And hmm. uh, then I went to another place and they were like, well, our blankets didn't come in, so we can't open yet. And I'm like, really? I've got a sleeping bag. I can do this. And he said, no, we're not open yet. And, and then other places were, were full. And, you know, I had to walk. And people kept asking me if, if I wanted them to call me a cab and I'm like, no, I, I, I came here to walk. I'm not taking a cab. And, and so I just kept walking and I, I must have looked really tired because everybody I saw wanted to get me a cab. And finally I got to this bar. Uh, they call them bars, but you buy coffee there and the kids are running around and, you know, they call it a bar. Um, but, um, I went there and he wanted to call me a cab and I'm like, no. And uh, so he called ahead and he said, they have a place for you in Estrella. So just go to Estrella. It's about an hour and a half more. And at that time it was like four o'clock. And oh boy, so I went like 5.30. And um, one of the really great things was when I got there, I met the people I saw on the second night. Um, so since I had, I didn't see them the whole time because they were ahead of me because they walked faster, but I had to walk 28K that day and I caught up. Oh, so you them. caught up. You caught up. It was so wonderful. To see you them. did the turtle and the hair thing, right? <laughs> I guess so, gosh. <laughs> but I, I, that was like a blessing to me to see them. And I walked Yes, in to have. Yeah, that I familiarity, right? You could, you knew you were, could talk to them, and you had a, a a bond, right? You, even though you split up, you still had that bond. Yeah, the um the first night we all made, I mean, not the first night, but the second night we all made a um a WhatsApp, and so we were like talking to each other the whole Camino and telling each other where we were. And it was, it was great. But yeah. I, um, like when I first, when I walked in at that second night, Shirley was standing at the stove making dinner. And then when I got to Estrella, there she was in the kitchen making dinner. <laughs> so that, that was really sweet. She's from Holland. And, um, oh, wow. Yeah. So the that first um okay the first night was really great but when I got to Saint Jean Pied de Court the walk over the Pyrenees but it was snowing on top of the Pyrenees and it was against the law to go over the top so I had to walk around the Pyrenees and go to Val Carlos instead of Orasan so when I got to Val Carlos that second night um, everybody was there. And they all, you know, couldn't have, couldn't go over the Pyrenees, and we were all kind of in the same boat. We had to walk around, and um, so um, 
I don't know, we had a lot of camaraderie. And um, I met a man from LA. And I, I met um, a guy from Germany, and a guy from a, a, well, it was a couple, but it was a sister and brother from um, Canada, and a lady from Oregon. And um, anyway, just all these random people that were there and um it was i mean it was i love those people <laughs> and we still say happy easter and happy christmas to each other and show each other our our christmas setup you know on um on whatsapp oh that's so fantastic do you feel that um you have this this connection with them, not just because you're connected digitally or WhatsApp, but that you traveled the same path for so many miles that like sort of your, your energy lines have sort of emerged, converged together that, you know, there's, there's something there that's even unspoken that you can be a little more honest with those people, or you have a deeper understanding of them. Like, what's yeah, your take on that? We, we, we all experience the Camino differently. I mean, like you say, one third of the people are on a spiritual journey and the other ones are doing something else. And um, that's what it was with that group too, but it, it didn't really matter. And um, like, of course I was there like like a month after the first person was done and they were watching me complete the Camino, you know, and- uh, They were cheering you on, I'm sure. They, they were cheering me on and being jealous at the same time. <laughs> They're like, and, uh, yeah, oh, you're still there. And then uh, last year when I went, I walked again in Portugal. Um, you know, I took them with me too. And we were Facebook friends. We saw each other's Facebook pages and stuff. And um, yeah, so I when I went in uh, um Portugal, I really became close with two people that I walked for quite a while with, and they walked fast, and I walked fast with them. So there I was walking as fast as I could for like a week with them, or even more than a week. And oh my gosh, I that I was so actually I was so glad when they needed to go on because. The, that one guy from Germany, he had a timeline. He had to be back to work at a certain time and he couldn't walk with me anymore because he needed to walk 24 hours a day towards the end. <laughs> Poor guy. Oh, wow. <laughs> but um, yeah, and the girl was from Chile. And um, so I just, um, I felt such a closeness with them. And um, we're, we're just, just like um, each other's, um, we just complement each other so well. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Would you, would you recommend it to other people who who need to? I don't know. I guess it, it it gives you a lot of time to. It's more than a weekend, right? It's like it gives you time to to really just decompress and to be with your thoughts. But like you said, if you can go by yourself, then you're not deflecting anything or, um, or you're, you're complete. If you go by yourself, you're completely doing it on your own and you find out things about your inner dialogue you might not have realized. Like when you really listen to your inner dialogue, it, it is very revealing. And uh, sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> If if people if people had a recorder of what they're saying to themselves, it would be a, a really good insight for a lot of people. That's the trick trying to um, you know release the monkey mind and um, a, adopt the high vibration and the, trying to uh, not think of the sad things and trying to think of the great things. And really there's so much beauty on the Camino. Oh my gosh, it's like the forest primeval or something, you know, it's just, oh my gosh. I'm, you know, I'm just imagining, you know, walking across the, a bridge over a little stream with 
um, the canopy of the trees above and the hangers on of the along the edge of the water and they're sending little streams of um, I don't know you know um, moss or something that's blowing uh, beneath you and uh, the little flowers and oh my gosh it's just such a, a lovely place to be or you know other times you're out on the mesita and and you're looking across fields of yellow flowers um because they they're just growing stuff over there people told me that the mesita would be boring and i'm like oh my gosh it was so not boring because it's the agriculture you know the modern agriculture maybe maybe it was really ugly and boring a long time ago but now because of the agriculture there it's just lush and you can see fields as far as you can see of yellow flowers, red flowers, um, so beautiful. And it was April when I was walking, well, April and May, and I finished in June. Um, but um, yeah, it was um, springtime when I was walking. And you know, I, I have to tell you, I, I walked during Holy Week too. So I took Holy Week off and I, stayed in a town during Holy Week. And I just went to church every day. And I sat with the, you know, there's a section of widows, I think, all these single older women. And I sat with them and I and they started recognizing me and smiling at me mm -hmm. and stuff. So it just made me so appreciative of being there. And I was, you know, I, I was feeling kind of weird because there I was in my walking clothes. And um, I was so glad on Easter, usually where I come from, everybody's got their new Easter dress on or something. And, and they weren't like that. They had regular clothes on. Um, well, it was cold. There was coats, you know, and stuff. And so I was very happy that that, that wasn't a thing over there. <laughs> you didn't have to wear your Easter bonnet. <laughs> well, it sounds like you found community wherever you went, you know? Even if the community was yourself and the nature. And, and you know, everybody, even if they don't have the spiritual connection, everybody had a wonderful experience. They were, they were just in awe of everything that was before them, you know. Um, yeah. So I, hmm. I didn't feel like um, anybody had a bad experience. I did meet a, a one night. I, I stayed at a, a place. It was a very special place, um, Chan Ball, um, and um, there was a, a, two men and one woman, and they were traveling together. And it was not an old man, but an older man. And then there was this young, like I don't know, maybe twenty year old. I have no idea. And he was so sad. And he was angry. You could tell he was angry and he wouldn't look at anybody and he was just there. And um, I kind of got a feeling maybe he had a loss or something. And these two other people brought him to the Camino to shake him out of it or something. I don't know. I mean, you know, you make up, I make up stories about people. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and so um, they were, it was such a beautiful thing to watch the older guy just being there for him the younger guy and um accepting him that in that um condition i guess and the girl too and they just were his guide along the way and um it was beautiful for me to see that so i think people go on the camino for a lot of different reasons um that he probably needed um a separation from his life at home to help him shake him out of whatever he was in. Um, there were people who most, a lot of people went there because they had a question in their life and they needed an answer. And they, they went to the Camino to find out. There were people who one person said, well, my job ended and my new job doesn't start for another month. So I decided to walk the Camino during that month. And um, 
there were just any number of reasons why people were there. People all the way from Australia. I met a lady. She had planned on walking the Camino with her brother, and he died. And so she was walking in honor of his, of him. <sighs> and um, yeah, so there's so many stories. I, w I walked into this one room and somebody, they were all sitting around drinking wine. That was actually at Carlos. They were sitting around drinking wine. And um, this guy looked up at me and said, my friend here is very sad. And so I walked over and I said, well, what are you sad about? And he said, three of my friends died in rapid succession and I just, they were such great friends and uh, they all died individually. And he said, I can't live my life anymore. I, I just can't do it. And somebody suggested I come to the Camino. And, mm -hmm. and so I sat down next to him and I said, yeah, you know, my husband died in August and my mother died in November. And, um, and I'm really sad too. And he said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry for your loss. We have something in common. And so that was, that was really very sweet that, you know, we got to have that connection. Yeah. And, and just the fact that somebody just randomly said, my friend's sad and sort of introduced you, you know, maybe he felt the sadness with you or, or, you know, the, that divine timing, right? That you guys were out of all the people staying there that day or having wine, you know, you guys were connected in your vulnerability and your sadness. Yeah. And I, you know, I still talk to those people. It's lovely. It's a experience I'm sure that changes people's lives forever. You know, it's a, Absolutely. And you know what? Um, you don't even have to walk the whole Camino. People um, like my friend Judy uh, started in Lyon and she walked to Santiago. It all depends on how much time you have. And of course, since my husband died, I had all the time in the world. And um, so, but there's uh, in Soria, if you go to Soria, then it's 100K from from Soria to Santiago. And a lot of people, if they just have a week or a weekend, depending on how fast they walk, they'll start in Soria. And um, all you have to do is walk from Soria to get the Compostela. And the Compostela is a, a certificate saying you walk the Camino. And so um, a lot of people, especially start in Soria because um, you know, for us in the U.S., when you go across the pond, you need to spend more than a week over there. That's what I feel like. I feel like if I'm going to fly all the way over there, I'm going to spend a couple of months over there. Um, yes. But um, a lot of people only have a week or, you know, whatever. And so they can just um, walk from Soria. And also the, the, the Portuguese Camino isn't as long as the other as um, the, the, the French way so some people start in Porto and just walk up to Santiago hmm. of course when I when I walked the Portuguese when I started in Lisbon and um, I say I tell people you know what if you don't have a lot of sins then you don't Lisbon because <laughs> it's it's pretty intense um walking from lisbon but uh, walking from porto isn't as bad well i really appreciate you sharing all these great things with with us it's been a great time is there anything else you wanted to um share about forgiveness or or your journey that you want to leave the listeners with i have a i have a special prayer that i say and mm -hmm. it's um it's like a miracle prayer miracles happen when i say it and, and the oh. prayer is, dear God, please make everything turn out okay. And then you, let ev then you let God make everything turn out okay. So it's like, when I do that, 
say, like I say it when I, there's nothing else I can do. I can't make this turn out okay. And so I say, dear God, please make this turn out okay. And God does make it turn out okay. And um, I think God really likes us to acknowledge that God is God. And maybe I can't do this, but God can do this. It takes the weight off, right? Like you, you did what you could. You had your intention. You took your action and then let it turn out okay, you know? And, and sometimes okay is, is perfect, right? It's perfect for the time. And, and sometimes it's better than you ever imagined. Like we can't even perceive what okay could be. And so leaving it to God is the highest good. He wants us to have our highest good. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to, I'm going to hold on to that one. That's, I'm going to hold on to so many parts of our conversation, but I really appreciate your sage quality that you're you're willing to share your experiences and 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 let people know you know you've been through some things like you've been through a lot and you've you've adjusted and you've kept your faith and you know and you acknowledge that not everybody not everybody has the same faith path but as long as you're you're doing better every day and you're trying to keep it up keep your vibration high that's that's what God wants, and that's what lets the angels come in to help us, because they they have to be, they have to have a space that they're needed and and that they're wanted to to help us. So I love that. We're at such a high vibration. If you can like raise your vibration, then you can, um, like you say, commune with them. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much. And um, I really appreciate all the time you spent with us. And um, I look forward to getting your book and reading about your travels, because I'm sure there's a ton of great other stories in there and insights that just I feel like I would be living vicariously through you. <laughs> I live near the Appalachian Trail. It starts not far from my house. And so I see people, I can tell the weekend hikers, like I'll go up and hike and then I can tell the people who are really on the trail, like they're going to go to Maine. They're like on their way. So it's, it's a, it's a very cool thing. Um, but I don't, the Appalachian trail doesn't have the great, um, hotels and, and, um, bunk facilities that you're describing and, the and upper days, yeah. The upper gaze, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I know my my sister, my um, my niece, uh, um, is a hiker, and I think she did the Appalachian Trail and the Pacific Coast Trail. And she looks at me, and here I am with this lightweight pack because I don't have to take my whole life with me because um, you know they it's set up for the pilgrims up over in Spain, and mm -hmm. she's got everything on her back, and she looks at me, and she's like, oh okay she rolls her eyes like <laughs> like i'm not a real backpacker you know because i don't have to take everything with me you're like i have over a thousand miles i had to go around the great pyrenees mountains i couldn't go over them <laughs> yeah it's, 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 not, um, it's an experience but it's not like the appalachian trail right Right. That is rugged. I mean, they have their, their mats they sleep on, their tents. So it's, yeah, that is rugged. Oh. <laughs> yeah, with the lightest, that's the science, just having the lightest pack you can. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. you just, that's what you do. So you can be happy on the canoe. Yeah. And I think that's part of the spirituality, just lighten your load, right? Like it's symbolic of of what you're doing you're releasing things you that no longer serve you in this trail and you're you're washing your clothes every day and you're just keeping on but you don't have to be burdened by by a lot of excess baggage yeah it's it's, it's there's so much symbolism in it i love i just love it it's very cool all right well i i do again i totally appreciate it and um i will let you go but thank you so much Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you for tuning in today, friends, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please like, share, and get 
alerts for upcoming podcasts. We'll have another one coming at you next Thursday. I hope you have a great one. And remember, each moment is a chance to live the life of your dreams. Take care.